Hello everyone and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gauthier Lamotte, your host, and today my guest is a fellow Frenchman, Stéphane Gere. Hi Stéphane. Hi Gauthier, nice being with you. So today we're talking about a very important topic, something that is very often not taken into account in the, the world of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain, but that is all that is a very important topic that doesn't belong to the world of blockchain, that belongs to actually the whole world of computer science and even engineering. We're going to talk about formal methods. And to start, first of all, Stefan, can you introduce yourself? Uh, certainly. Um, as you mentioned, uh, this may not be a direct topic, um, but indeed I have a background, in fact, in software engineering in general. That's my education. And uh, I would say the first 10 years of my own career were basically centered around the overall topic. We'll probably discuss about that, but what I would call VNV, verification and validate, validation, verify, and validate which is a general topic we have in any kind of software environment. And I don't see why it should not be the case uh, in the cryptographic environment, which is why should we trust uh, any kind of software? Uh, what can we do to trust it or to better trust it or to decide about trusting it? And how much uh, are the formal methods? We'll see what it means uh, relevant to that matter. So this been the f my education in the first 10 years of my career. Then I have step-by-step uh, -step evolved uh, to, if I may, um, most of the, the core of my career, I would say, was with what we call big firms, so auditing firms. And precisely my job in that environment was to use VNV uh, technology or approach or methods to decide about whether the counting software would be reliable, trusted, etc., and then then I shifted to cybersecurity consulting. But it's a it's kind of a linear evolution for, for of the base the same basis, which is can we trust software, and why? Wonderful. So you have a huge background in IT, and then you discovered form, what we formally call formal methods. Sorry for the pun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I may, uh, I discovered, uh, I educated, uh, or I graduated in what we call in French, super uh, which is an engineering school uh, dedicated to, um, uh, sorry, um, the, the, air, the aircraft industry. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the time where precisely the aircraft industry was making the shift to all embedded software driven systems. So the, the key question for, for this environment at the time, and also that was true for the tel telco industry, by the way, was uh, can we, bloody hell, can we can we rely on that software to, to drive an aircraft? Um, so, yeah. So the, the, that's the, uh, and the formal methods definitely, uh, well, probably they were in their infancy at the time, I would say, but it, even so, uh, for me, I would say the peak of what I knew about formal method at the time were the B method, I don't know if it's, or Z method as well. I don't know if they're relevant anymore, but I don't see why it should change anything. They are still using it because, uh, you know, yeah. there, there's even the Z3, uh, it's the yeah, third iteration now, but the Z3 theorem prover uh, that uh, we're actually using at Mutual Knowledge System. There you go. Then then I had to use the Z very zero, but possibly, whatever. <laughs> And so, big question, what are formal methods? Uh, what are formal methods? Um, in the general spectrum of what we can imagine using as technology for deciding about whether we can trust software, uh, the, uh, the, there's a thinking that, the, of course, the absolute way to do this would be to say, can we prove that the piece of software would be uh, correct, whatever that means, okay? I suppose it means uh, it doesn't produce any undesired property and it has the systematically the properties that we're looking for, something it, like that? 
Yeah, if I, if I may, let's let's tr let's try to cut some things in, in part. Okay, I, I, I agree with you. We'll come to that. But the, the initial thinking is: Can we prove whatever? The, what we can prove is is a second point. If I may, is it can provable? we prove? Can exactly is it provable? Can we prove it? Well, there's an obvious way to do this, which would say. Well, it looks the uh, software seems to be pretty rigorous. It's not very far from being something like writing mathematics, okay, at first sight at least. Uh, so it it came very easily to mind to say, well, if we can prove that any piece of software rigorous enough uh, in its design and writing, uh, then probably if we translate it into into some mathematical format then this mathematical format probably can be an object to proof in the usual mathematical thinking of what we think in proving something correct or not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the initial thinking of the former method, which then means piece of software translated somehow into some equations or uh, um, if not equation, uh, how do you say that? Uh, 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 um, sorry. Um, my, my English in that area is a bit What's rusty, the, but uh, anyway, the French word? <laughs> um, uh, a session is you need to okay. translate it to an, a, an assertion, and then you need to say whether you can prove that assertion against your point, some statement, which is supposed to be the oracle. That is what we want to actually indeed prove that would be uh, uh, ensured. So we, you have to go all through all those steps. Okay. Uh, and Z at the time was the first um, core mathematical uh, engine, I would say, and approach to to go through all those steps. Take some software, translate it into um, equations uh, based on the number of uh, uh, yeah requirements that you would like to be proven against, and then to to run it to decide whether it will be proven or not proven. Uh, I think I think that's it about formal method. You can make more or less sophisticated because you can then to 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 improve this. There's a number of things that you can do, of course. I guess okay, uh, and probably you will be able to approach more and more varied software. I mean, the, because programming languages okay do vary quite a lot, and I guess it's definitely the case in cryptographic uh, environment. Okay. So one definitely improvement would be the capacity to approach and, and, and process varied languages and environment. Okay, fine. But at the end of the day, the core is still a mathematical problem. Uh, you still need to be able to do a mathematical proof against some properties. That's it. I don't see why it should be changing. And 20 years from now, it's probably going to be still the same. Wow, that's fascinating. So, uh, it, also, it's a, it's a good thing you started that in France. It, well, you saw the discipline it's in its infancy. Yes. For, for our listeners, France here is uh, was quite advanced already, uh, very early in the, in the world in of formal methods, because of the nuclear industry and uh, the yes. railroad industry, and also because yes. we have Airbus, um, which is a competitor. Uh, and that's the company I've been working for, obviously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've been doing that for Airbus, but, but not only for Airbus. Uh, one of the first uh, truly interesting experiments I had to come through was the, for uh, the city of Lyon, okay, L Y O N. At the time, they were starting to develop an automatic metro before before the automatic metro that we have in Paris. Okay, the D line in in Lyon at the time was the first automatic uh, truly uh, running. Uh, line and, and we had to to run through their code uh, to to find some uh, uh, glitches. So yeah, uh, the Metro de Lyon at the time was uh, one of the first lines that was uh, proven. fascinating. Fascinating yes. because it's ju just like line fourteen in Paris. Um, mm -hmm. Those lines do not bug; they are flawless, and I love it. And my heart, as a uh, as a person born in this city in Lyon, is uh, <laughs> is vibrating because I've been taking this D line when I was a child yeah. quite a lot. And my uncle built the the, the architecture. My, my great uncle built the architecture of this whole uh, uh, these then, whole subway stations. So that's uh, then I have a story, a quick quick story for that. I mean, we we had the the, the code delivered for us uh, to us for for some 
testing, uh, because uh, what happened was during the testing period of the line, suddenly uh, um, a train stopped uh, and they had no explanation why it stopped. So they identified that, yeah, there must be a glitch somewhere. And so we ran through the code and we eventually found that two lines from in a if then else part of code, there was the two lines were identical. So it was exactly like the if then, if then else did not exist. Uh, and but we we found it by this kind of technology. Wonderful. And so um, so then I have three questions, but the first one, uh, <laughs> uh, aeronautical industry, um, mm -hmm. typical use case. There was this incident uh, involving Boeing a few years ago, where basically, if I remember correctly, the uh, the lever that uh, the, the the pilot was uh, was pulling did not respond because the software was denying the the command in, inputted by the lever. So basically, some people said by lack of formal methods or formal verification of the code, there was this huge bug that led to the death of people who were in the plane. Uh, Possibly. Possibly. Did you know about that one? No, I did not. I have other examples. Uh, okay, which is uh, the one you have? Um, well, actually, it's a, it's a, an example I love because it's an example of the, and maybe that's also good for the conversation, of the limits of the formal methods. So I would reverse the example if I, if I can say so. Please. And uh, you may be aware of Ariane uh, rocket. Yeah, the French. space shuttle. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that was Ariane 5. Okay. Uh, there was before that there was Ariane 4, okay, mm -hmm. which was a traditional rocket, I would say. And then they moved to Ariane 5, which indeed was triple rockets and with a shuttle, uh, indeed. The very first flight, flight 501, and I don't remember which year, but it might be in 80, 1986 or something like that, the, the, in the late 80s, whatever. The first flight, uh, you, so you see the rocket going up, uh, you see the rocket going up, and very quickly, very suddenly, then suddenly it goes this way, and because of the of the tension, it just explodes. Uh, but but in in a matter of seconds, and goes straight up, then so slightly moves, and then completely turns and explodes. And why? Because at the time, what, what's the point? The point is. This was designed out of the Ariane 4, which was a very, very reliable. So they had basically tried to inherit all the reliability from Ariane 4. Still, it was totally coded in ADA, A -D -A, okay, uh, which was supposed to be very trustable kind of language, whatever. And still, it exploded. Why? Couldn't find any flow in the, in the programming, nothing, except one thing, which was they used the sorry for the story but i think it's an interesting case because it's, it proves the limit of the whole point the software was flawless except for one thing it assumed that the the, the hardware technology especially the gyroscopic system which basically mm -hmm. gives you the direction okay this one com came from iron4 it was very reliable and flawless but it was a null technology it worked on four bits bus iron iron five was on an eight bit bus oh. so yes so you had to make a conversion from eight to four which is okay when you have positive numbers but when you have negative numbers you need to make sure that the the you see what i mean the, the hardware, of, course, of course yes that that had not been properly handled so what happened was that the, the rocket goes up then a negative number as an angle is provided. And that was, instead of turning negative, it was turned into a positive number. So, oh, the, system, yeah. so the system the system reacted as a positive number, but it just went off. The point yeah. being here, the point being here, and it's, it's your initial question, is what you should you prove the system against? Yeah, that's absolutely mind-boggling. And uh, th that kind of reminds me this anecdote of the anti-missile system very used in computer science where basically the um, 
the encoding of the flo uh, of the floating uh, numbers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. led to a, a tiny tiny time gap between each calculation and uh, over the course of uh, of a day the yeah uh, the, the i'll put the the anecdote in the description of the video for the listeners uh so th that that leads me to another question how do you prove competently against you know this or that assertion because that's f mathematically quite fascinating but philosophically that's mind-boggling because basically what you guys are doing is proving somehow the inexistence of a bug so, exactly <laughs> and it's very and hard to prove that some something exactly. doesn't exist exactly and, and that's why i start at the beginning of our discussion when you i i, I insisted that we split off the, the, the logic that is behind the formal methods, because when you think about them, I mean, they're, they're kind of, in terms of design, they, they're kind of flawless, okay? And it's it's mathematics. You, you, you just engineer and process, but it's mathematics. So still, when you're still within themselves, you're not, except if the program itself is, is bugged, okay, fine. But if it's not, uh, a proof is a proof. The key question with, Formal methods is can we model in a mathematical system that those formal methods are? Can we truly model the programming language and the running environment? If we can, then hopefully you, you can prove something. That's one. Second is okay, the software is running within an environment, even bigger one. And here it was a physical environment. If you don't reflect uh, positively, I mean, reliably the, the physical environment within your software environment there's no hope that you can find anything and, and the example of Ariane in my opinion is exact is exactly to that point i mean the software itself by itself with its system assumptions was correct the system assumptions were not correct so that, that that's the same debate that that we have in philosophy basically uh, sometimes there's a remarkable internal coherence within the system but the premise uh, the the um, uh, the axioms of the systems uh, of the system are flawed and you don't Correct. want to attack the internal coherence of the system because it has obviously been uh, thought out very well and oh oops actually the axioms Correct. were very flawed and yes uh, so to, to come back to your initial questions and, and I guess the theme of today is, in my opinion, uh, in software in general and, and the software that we live within being pretty complex, even getting even so on a daily basis, the true challenge uh, is certainly to have the ability to describe the under underlying environment in such a way that you, you can hope to do anything, any, how can I say, uh, valuable proof. I mean, you can certainly do a proof, but a valuable proof is a different matter. That's one. Second, I'm not sure, this is a question mark, but uh, my, my experience tells me that it's not that simple uh, to be able to translate the programming language in its running environment into something that you can indeed describe within a formal method. Because again, uh, even, even a simple program like this, like a, a smart contract, for instance, okay, is, is going to be kind of a short piece of code. Hmm. Okay, fine. But it's the short piece of code and box itself with itself, all the description, mathematical description of the programming environment. Okay. So anyway, what I mean is, if you, if you write a, a, an instruction, the instruction has some translation into math. Of course. It, it translates a status into a new status, a before into an after. This transition needs to be described in math as well. Otherwise, question, see? Question about that. Is the level of abstraction of the language, okay. um, so for our listeners, basically the amount of um, computer uh, of routines happening within the computer with just a, a short line of code. So if the language is very abstract, there are many things happening under the hood. And if the language is not abstract for the same routine, you will have to, to, to type many more things. Um, yeah. Is it basically 
uh, dependent on this level of abstraction. The, the difficulty to, uh, to mathematically transcribe code to a mathematical equation in order to, to establish your proof, Do, is it dependent on that, on that level of abstraction or not at all? It's a, it's a very good question. And uh, I think in general, the answer is it depends. Okay. Um, there's a concept in software engineering, which is um, semantic denotation. If I remember well, the, the English term for that, uh, any, any syntax construct in any kind of language has some meaning, programming meaning. Okay. Again, any construct will move integrally move you from a previous status. Okay, in terms of variables, constants, uh, data, etc., to a new a new status. Okay, uh, in the machine, whatever the machine, it it's, can be pretty complicated if, if you go down into the machine registers in the into the CPU. But you have layers in between, and sometimes the layers are only building an abstraction. To your point, so the question is to find what is the middle kind of abstraction which would be enough to truly translate what we think is what the machine does in that language, not in reality, but in that language. In other words, it, it, I don't know what can I use as a, as a construct. Uh, mm, it can be very simple. If you, if you take an assignment, uh, x plus equal x uh, one, x plus equal one, okay? You just take a variable and you add one to it. You, you don't need to have something very sophisticated. Uh, you don't need to translate this into the reality of what the machine truly does. Okay, You just need to have the, the, the equivalent of that. You don't need to go to the implementation to be able to prove anything on that one. You, okay, But if your construct would be, for instance, in, and I would not be surprised in smart construct, it would be the case. If you start using constructs which are time dependent uh, and you you go into parallel programming, whereby, it, because I, I would not be surprised into uh, this, uh, your, your environment, you have parallel programming. If you start to have a parallel programming, then you need to translate into mathematics what the, 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 the protocols are which are underlying the parallel programming truly are going to be. Hmm. Well, this Otherwise is. Otherwise, you cannot prove anything. Oh, you, you just cannot prove anything. That, that, uh, that's something I heard already from uh, from a few uh, former methods addicts in the um, in the field of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so, no matter what, this is very important in the field uh, um, of payments uh, on the blockchain mm -hmm. because you have to make sure that the protocol is flawless because. Legally, you won't be able to sue a bank if your money is lost. So yeah. that's why you have to be very sure yeah. of the of the correctness of the code. Even if the cryptocurrency itself, the token is not a, a shit coin, it's not a scam. You have to have a very good protocol in order to, uh, to make this a trustable asset. Uh, so um, same level of... Uh, and people are trying to break the code constantly because it's open source. So same level of paranoia that, that we would have at NASA or in, a new, um, in the defense industry but the thing is that there, there is a strong difference between uh, account view blockchains such as ethereum where there's a, an instant snapshot of the blockchain after each transaction and the utxo blockchain where basically there are many many separate parallel payment channels between um, users and so I, I assume then i'm not a formal methods expert but i assume then uh, proving the correctness of a utxo blockchain such as uh, Bitcoin Cash or Cardano would be maybe slightly harder than uh, than an account view like S Ethereum? Probably. By what you just tell me at the moment, yes, probably. Because you would need, typically, if you need to reach any conclusion, you would need to have your um, your system at that kind of level to, to be able to draw any kind of conclusion. Because the risk of mistakes, uh, the, why, why that? Because you, you're looking for, are there some bugs, okay? And you cannot, you can only can have bugs if they are meaningful at the level of the language. If the language is designed for, again, parallel programming, then you need to take this into account in your, into your proof system. Otherwise, you, you don't prove anything. Hmm, that's interesting. The, the solution we had found at the time uh, at, at Moon was to, uh, uh, to emulate the account view to simplify the problem. Good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh... so, so what I'm trying to say is uh, in, in theory pro and it's even more complicated than that but in theory 
the, the Z methods are equivalent are, are pretty simple. They, they should be used more broadly because I mean, as soon as you have the system design, as soon as you have the programming language design as well, it, it's, in, it's in there. The system is available. Okay, it, it's, uh, it's, it does compute, consume resources to be run. Okay, fair enough. All right. But if, apart from that, uh, it's pretty simple to use. You, you, you could expect it's, it would be used quite, quite often, uh, easily, broadly, blah, blah, blah. It's not the case, to, to, at least to my knowledge, okay, for quite a number of reasons. So you might think, why so? And in my experience, which is an old one already, but anyway, uh, the true, the key factors which are impeding a uh, broader use of all methods is one, Precisely, uh, the, a reliable uh, mathematical descriptions of the language, programming language and environment. Okay, that's pretty tricky. And uh, the ability to describe the um, assumptions, or no, sorry, the, ah, je vais y arriver. Yes, assertions. <laughs> yes, assertions. Why, why, why am I? It's exactly assertions. Uh, to a level which indeed would be um, having any kind of uh, yeah legal value or formal value, if I can say. That also is pretty complicated. An example I gave about IN5 is, uh, is, a, is a good one. Resources, I mean, running resources is quite uh, heavy as well. It's, it costs a lot to run, mm -hmm. but that could be marginal. Uh, and, and that's also why in my experience, even in such environments, there has been quite a number of other kinds of approaches than formal methods, which are used uh, instead of formal methods to try and bring some answer to the VNV problem I initially gave. If formal methods are not the panacea, okay, fine. What, what else do we have? And we there are quite a number of other options. Uh, terminology question, is there a difference um, between formal verification and formal methods? One is the use of the other. Oh, okay. So formal verification uh, derives from formal methods. It's, uh, uh, yes. it's a sub-process of it. Okay, thank you. To my understanding, yes, it, uh, yes. it's no, nothing more. All right. See, and so um, what you're describing here, is it a trade-off? saying, okay, we have relatively reliable systems to prove uh, the safety of a, of a piece of code. It's not as efficient as for, uh, effective as formal meta methods, but it's maybe a bit more efficient. Good enough. It's good enough for, for, for the job. Yes. And is that yes. why um, yes. they are underused at the moment? Yes, it is, of course. Hmm. Of course, uh, one of the key elements in all those, uh, this industry, I would say, because it's an industry, <clears throat> it's precisely the trade-off. Um, if you are developing a piece of software, I don't know what, I mean, uh, uh, e-business software. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I don't know, consumer-oriented company. Um, think of anything, I don't know, LVMH, okay, review to Louis Whatever. Vuitton. It could okay. be any. Carrefour. It, it, it could be any. Anyway. So, something, uh, yeah. A, a, a top company like Walmart. Uh, yes. Carrefour. Uh, Chanel, Walmart. Uh, the Champagne. Yeah. Whatever. They sell, Whatever. You sell stuff. You sell stuff. Whatever. At scale. The point is, you sell it at scale. Huge scale. But every piece of object, every transaction, at the scale of your environment, of course, you, you don't want to have issues in in the, in the buying process. You don't want to have issues in the paying process. You don't want to find yourself spending time in uh, client uh, support. Okay, so you want it reliable. Sure, you do, absolutely. But how much are you going to be willing to pay for that extra trust into the ability of your system to be truly re reliable? Or are you willing to go through things like Okay, I've had my software reviewed, tested, experts have given an a, a view, it's been audited by experts, okay, fine. Then I, I just go shipping. And if there are some issues, well, we'll manage, we will improve. 
And at the end of the day, it will be reliable enough so that we only have residual issues, which we can handle and manage with the client support. Okay. Yeah. But we're not, but we're not going to spend much more than that into any formal pr pr proof because for one reason, it, which is our system evolves on a daily basis. Mm. Okay. So if, we, if it, yeah. if it were a, a, a purchasing or buying system, which is one for all, like you have on a satellite, for instance. Okay, maybe I'm going to be willing to for it to be truly secure and reliable because it's only one for all. But if it's something that is going to be changed, I'm not going to run it through formal methods every so often. Okay. okay. So, so in, in, if you're sending a probe around Pluto, yes, of course you cannot send a poor guy to turn it on and off and, uh, and right. re reactivate it. So you cannot say I tested it five thousand times. You have to be absolute hundred percent sure that there's no bug. Correct. Or, if it's yeah. a, if it's a small business uh, or even a big business online that you can cover with insurance, then but you can patch if you can patch yeah. your software. Okay. Yeah. Send a bug patch, report. You have a bug report. You, you patch it. Maybe you're going to incur some cost. If, okay, fine. It's not going to. Be. And, and of course, the more trust you have in the in the, in the software prior, the better. Obviously. Okay. But at least you you have different ways to handle it. I mean, you can patch it. You can change it. And you have had experts which are going to be. Uh, more reputed, okay, because formal methods are not reputed. So you, you, you consider other options. But when you, in, indeed, that, to your point, when, when it's a matter of having software embedded into the satellite, well, what else can you do? You need to be sure before you launch it. Absolutely, yeah, of course. So that, that's a totally different market. I assume if the. Um... I assume, uh, if I remember correctly, the the probe that is on Pluto and that was supposed to to shut down when it reached Pluto, but it turns out it's still live and kicking. So they they hired another Fortran expert to uh, mm -hmm. to maintain yeah. it because the the lady who programmed it w went into retirement. I yes. assume the the simplicity, the elegant simplicity of the code makes it also easier to formally verify it. Uh, yes, I mean we uh, the, the very. The probably best two examples. It's not so much the Pluto Pro; it's Voyager One and Voyager Two. Okay. Uh, you know the, the the probes which are still flying two billion kilometers away, and it's been like forty years already. Uh, I think, if I remember well, they were launched in seventy-seven or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. The, uh, same year as Star Wars, the first one. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, we're talking about. I, I don't have the numbers top of my head, but you talk, we're talking about piece of software which are by thousands lines of code, possibly not quite more, much more than that. Uh, and it is it needs to be pretty well designed code anyway because they've been able to patch it anyway. I mean, it's a it's a self patching code. I don't know how they did it at the time, but it is a self patching code. But even so, I mean, we're talking about thousands of lines. I mean, any any e-commerce software that we're talking about today Much more is in that. millions is in millions of lines. You just cannot afford to prove it formally. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, and also because if there's a problem in your e-commerce website, you can just refund the customer, or you can you have insurance. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, although insurances are quite expensive, because I think uh, a website like Booking.com, for example, is around ten thousand uh, ten thousand bookings per minute. So, if I remember correctly, the IT uh, safety uh, safety companies of these uh, of these huge e-commerce websites have a penalty that is insurable, and they have a penalty to pay if they uh, if this website is shut down for more than a few minutes. So they they have people working twenty four seven just in case there's a failure, uh, but that's yeah. But it's still, it, but it's probably still going to be manageable. And again, you need to you need to compare to the price it would be it would cost exactly for every single version of every single piece of software on each device exactly to be <laughs> proven. But by a system which is pretty cost, pretty resource consuming. I mean, so that I think that's the reason why formal methods are still around. Let's be positive. Formal methods are still around. I mean, I'm talking about something which is like 30 years back in my for me. Okay, but there's still we're talking about something which is still running. So there's a market for it. 
I would, even, I would even say there's a market that is growing, albeit very slowly, but um, the, the, the number of, of mathematicians and uh, computer science engineers who are working in the field of formal methods is now a f couple of thousands of people, which is much, much higher than what we had in the, in the 80s. Certainly. We, we, at the time, we were like hundreds, possibly. Yeah, every, <laughs> it was a very small club. So yeah, yeah, okay, but I understand, I understand why this is not uh, so popular. And, and in the blockchain world, we have that problem as well because the the, the big uh, holy grail at the moment is interoperability. How can we manage to have? Um, it's impossible to have one huge scalable blockchain, and so now nobody wants to be the the Ethereum or Bitcoin killer anymore. Nobody wants to be the top blockchain. Everyone wants to be able to say, okay. I just get paid from my own blockchain and I receive money from yours. And just like banks interoperate with each other, blockchains interoperate because otherwise the system is not sustainable. The problem is then you have to match the client code of uh, like the on-chain and off-chain code of two blockchains plus the client code of each wallet. And that's already six pieces of code. So I understand why some people advocate elegant and simple engineering to have blockchains that have the same standards is perhaps less creative, but it's also... It's uh, more reliable. Yeah. It's more reliable. Yeah. Procedures. And, 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 and you, I guess this is making the point I had at the very, very beginning, which is the true <clears throat> blocker, if I can say, what is truly hindering development is, again, you need to <clears throat> to turn into mathematics the outside environment. That's exactly your point. You say the core may not be complicated, but you need to have extra the extra systems on, on one side and on the other side described as well. Otherwise, you don't prove anything. Hmm. So you, you, I, you, basically what you're saying is either you focus on the core and the core is simple enough, it needs to be pretty reliable, pretty simple. So this part is simply probably uh, the part that you can um, afford to have mathematically proven. Fine, totally fine. But then, of course, it would be at the price of some uncertainty or other techniques to prove or to get trust from for the external systems. You, you see what I'm trying to say? Absolutely, yeah. So the yeah, added complexity also uh, also um, adds a lo uh, quite a lot of a budget and time. Yeah, yeah, it's a trade-off. I mean, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a side conversation, but we, we are in a business environment, okay? And mm -hmm. we're talking about something which is uh, purely technology uh, focused, but in fact, it's in a business environment. Mm -hmm. And like anything in business environment, we you need to have trade-offs in terms of cost and gain. Yeah, it's especially, especially in, uh, in a field where there's just money, just money at stake and no, not human lives. Mm -hmm. So so that, that makes the trade-off all the more interesting. Even... Even when it's human life, you still have trade-offs anyway. That's true. Even, that's true. Even, even, yeah. even in, I mean, you, you, yeah, even in that kind of environment, you can have money, but you will still need to justify big numbers. Mm. At some point, you have trade-offs. Uh, anyway. Allow me to rephrase it. I would say human lives that would be scandalous to waste in terms of public relations, mm. uh, because indeed. There is absolutely no perfect system. Uh, I remember that talk for, from Milton Friedman where a person said, oh, but they decided that it was not worth to, to save one extra life for a, a billion dollars. But th there is such a thing as a life too costly to save because even by doing insurance, the, even insurance by doing so, you're, you're going to kill other people just to save yeah, one yeah. more. So, yeah, insurance is yeah. give us a price. Um, so, yeah. Oh, uh, that leads me to one thing, though. Uh, to one question. Sorry? Th that leads me to one uh, one question, though. Yeah. Um, the, the field of artificial intelligence, ma many people mm -hmm. say, oh, artificial intelligence is about mathematics, but it's a very different branch of mathematics. Uh, some people would say it's not even mathematics, it's just statistics. So uh, depending on, on uh, the definition we're using, but here, from what I'm understanding, so formal methods are based on logic, uh, logic yes. logi logical um, deductions yes. and very precise reprodu uh, reproducible methods. Whereas yes. at the moment, our, what we call artificial intelligence, because the definition has evolved over the decades, but at the moment, what we call inter artificial intelligence is basically a program that will deliver the answer that is statistically expected to be the most relevant one. Um, yes. 
so that, that well many many human being beings actually think like that so we could say they <laughs> that's close to a human being but still that's by no means the same thing as those mathematics and so would it be possible to use formal methods to for example uh, establish boundaries uh, for an ai not to develop emerging properties or is it completely <laughs> impossible uh, in this regard because the the two fields are phil philosophically completely <laughs> It looks like math, but it, it's not the same flavor and it's not the same epistemological basis. So would yeah. it be totally impossible? Uh, I hear two different angles in, in your question. Let me try to rephrase those angles and then to try to answer. The, the first angle comes from the uh, crypto environment and decide whether AI would be the technology that possibly could be used for proving anything from the crypto systems. That's mm -hmm. one. And your and your second question is more like reversing. We have AI system. Would it be meaningful and possible to use formal methods for proving those systems? That's what the two questions are here. Uh, let me try to take the second one. Of course. Well, uh, hold on. No, the first one is probably going to be quicker. But hold <laughs> on. <laughs> hold on. Um, I, think, I think we can use AI to bring some answer let's say not proof we cannot it's, it's meaningless to expect ai to prove anything to prove anything because to your point even a well-trained system is only going to to answer what is the best suited or the, the closest uh, result from what it was trained to tell so it's not a proof it's not mathematic it's not logic it's the it's more like, um, yeah, um, similarity, I would say. It's what is most similar to what the system has already been trained to tell is correct. So it's going to be given a pretty useful, pretty, pretty reliable answer, but it's not going to take a proof. I cannot prove anything just by the fact that it's similar to what I've used to say was already proven. Okay, Proven, 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 proven doesn't imply proven. Because if there is any slightest difference in the environment compared to what it was already uh, exposed to, it's going to say, yes, it's the same thing. Well, it's not. Yeah, so that's the problem. Uh, many people think that, uh, that AI is wonderful uh, and can help you. Yes, but only if the answer you're expecting is in the middle of the bell curve in terms of the... Uh, exactly. Of comp exactly. Uh, uh, of the sample it, ha it has been trained with and of the competency of the guy who basically clicks and says, this is a good answer or this is not a good one. So Correct. And the political... Correct. And, provided, and provided that the, the, ver the variations and the... the, the the amplitude of variations is very pretty narrow so that you still i mean you, you, it's like you have an amplitude of what correct is okay if you have an amplitude for what correct is yeah fair enough but but the proof method is not it has no amplitude it's correct or it's not correct that's it so so i think it can be used it can be useful but only with some caveat which is yeah 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 we've already seen this kind of co code already We've already seen such code which we claim was correct. So it's likely that this one is correct as well. That would be a caveat. Well, but it's, that's it. But it's not a proof. Well, um, one expert in artificial intelligence I, uh, I talked to the other day told me, yeah, maybe we can do the, the artisanship test or something like that for an AI to... Uh, to, to prove the sentience of an AI, we should uh, give the AI a problem that we know uh, human beings have been able to solve and not tell it the solution and and, th and see if the, the AI can eventually find the solution. And the uh, chat GPT actually found um, quite a few interesting exploits to break smart contracts and and it exactly found the um, the, the, the fails, uh, the, the, um, the little cracks in the code and the safety failures that human beings had exploited, but it's because these these actually these failures these little bugs were very well known in the world of um, yeah, of computer programming i hear that and i certainly cannot dispute this i mean that makes sense but if i may mm -hmm. you are reversing the logic you you are telling me that ai was able to find failures fine no it, I, i'm saying it has been trained to find these failures because it's a yeah. failure it has already already seen okay but if it doesn't find one that doesn't mean that it's proven correct 
Yes, absolutely. That, that's that, that's the main problem is that the the AI is thinking like an engineer saying I tested it five thousand times and I didn't find any bugs. That's it. Which is not the same thing as a mathematician. And that's the same thing when people verify a mathematical theorem. Mathematicians do uh, do not only want to say we never found a problem in the uh, we never found a counterexample in a, a billion attempts no we want a proof and a proof is something else philosophy that's the point so yeah. again ai i think ai again to, coming from the trade of conversation okay mm -hmm. ai can be a valuable technology uh, uh, instead of formal methods mm -hmm. to to bring some trust definitely but it's not going to bring any proof that's the that, that's the spectrum. I mean, basically, you're saying we have formal proof. We have we may have AI. We have traditional testing. We have we code reviewing, for instance. All those are different technologies, which at the end of the day, aim at providing some trust and and answer in terms of correctness. Okay, so yeah. there's there's a range of technology that can be used. AI probably is going to be positioned very well against formal methods. Yes, but it's not going to be bring up the proof. It's a yeah different trade-off and uh, depending on what you're looking for. And, and regarding so the other possibility, how to limit emerging properties from an AI and uh, using formal methods, is, uh, is it something that would be possible? I, on that, I'm not an operational expert, if I can say. I don't see why you should not. I, I would be... Um, cautious here because it's a, it, I think the answer to, to provide a good answer you need to have some operational experience because it, it seems to me that in theory I don't see why it should the answer should not be yes but I think the key question is going to be operationally does hmm. it work truly is it is it easy enough costless enough to be to be handled I don't know about that to be honest you see what I'm saying yes absolutely that, that's typically the cross experts discussion uh, I would need to have maybe four or five people uh, debating yes. about that in front of my screen. You, you just need to try and do it and see how much it costs. And I don't know about that, to be honest. So I, I cannot answer this one. So the other one was, uh, can we use formal method on AI? Yeah. And, and here, I think it's a no, definitely no, and for a totally different reason. Uh, the way I understand AI currently, basically a you know, neural network, okay? anything based on neural networks, uh, it's structured, to my understanding, in basically two main layers. You have indeed the, the, the part which is mathematical, because you say you need to be very mathematical, is indeed the, the neural network itself, the structure, the, the part, the code part itself, which basically builds up every single node, holds the data for every single node, uh, runs the, describes and runs the machinery of computing, all of that. Uh, handling the testing and apprentice, uh, apprenticeship uh, phases, so all this machinery, okay, which is uh, running basically, suddenly can be proven. It's code. You can prove code against something, okay. So in theory, that part we could discuss. Where it's definitely going to be tricky is the, the layer on top, and the layer on top is the data. Every single node has a number of numbers. I mean, each node has a weight, weight, maybe sometimes several weights, which are themselves being uh, computed after the training phases. Okay, so we, if we know about the nodes structured coding, we don't know about the weights. The weights are the result of training. Mm. There's no way you can prove anything on the training part. And at the end of the day, when you run AI, you're not running the the, the the coding part. You're running the coding part plus the weights, that is data. It's it's a bit like, um, how can I say? Do, do you know languages, programming languages like Lisp? Oh, and, yes, uh, absolutely. Okay, then you know that Lisp is, is, the structure of Lisp is the data and the program are exactly the same shape. And it's on intent, it's purpose. It's it's done so that the data can be used as a program and the program can be influenced by the data. Yeah, that's elegant. Okay, it's exactly the same. You can prove the you can prove the program. You cannot prove the data. Hmm. So the problem with AI, in terms of formal method and even beyond that, 
V and V, uh, correct, deciding about correctness about AI is intricated, not so much so because of the coding part. It, that can be complicated, but you probably can handle it anyway. But the, the tricky part is the data, because the data comes from the training. I think nobody is going to be ever able to read the data and to decide, yes, that weight here is correct, that weight here is not correct. How can you do that? How can you decide about correctness, about all the thousands, if not millions, of data points that you have, which come from the training phases, and which, in fact, are reflecting thousands and thousands of exposures during the training phase? You, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no, there's no way you can prove anything on that part. Also, no pl plus the fact that there's also a, it's a black box algor a black box algorithm. There's always a component of randomness in genetic algorithms in order to to try and iterate new things. So that's also very basically even 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 proving the correctness of it would mean to maybe limit it a, a, a limit it a bit a, a bit. Uh, no, I would not. I'm not sure. I, okay, uh, code is code. You can you can expect to prove something on code hmm. anyway. The caveat I think is different is um, genetic programming is again it's 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 data driven again you, you, you don't change you don't change programming doesn't invent itself coding doesn't invent itself it's only sh changing its shape based on parameters and parameters are changed based on exposure on interaction okay always so again the the, the and the, and the algorithm for changing the algorithm is an algorithm itself. So you can prove an algorithm. The question is, you're going to prove, to prove it against what? Mm. How do you decide what correct means? How do you decide what correct means that you need to prove against? And so one question when you're saying proving against, just to... Um... Uh, if you please to uh, to to, to end, on, uh, end uh, this lovely podcast on uh, on this very uh, fascinating question, um, when you're t uh, saying we we prove the correctness against something, does that mean that basically we have a hypothesis and we're prove uh, we're testing the hypothesis yes. and finding a, trying to find a counterexample, and so the proof is that we haven't found a counterexample, or is it something deeper? saying that in this closed system, there's a proof that this cannot happen. Um, definitely the last one would be correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually, usually you try to prove a system that either it's never going to meet this or that status. It's not going to drift out of, of reliability boundaries. Okay, so we've proven that this specific uh, event is not in the trees of possibilities, uh, the trees of correct. outcomes of this program. Correct. You, you mean there is there is no such thing as a correct language, programming language. A correct language, <clears throat> if the language is fl flawless, I mean, again, it's if supposed to move a status from A to B, mm -hmm. and if it's if it does this, it can be proven as such. Then, if you assume it correct, it's always going to move A to B. The question is whether B is going to be incorrect in the sense that it's going to break your own assumptions. Your system should never be in such status. Your system, uh, I mean, how can I say? Uh, you need to define what trustworthy is. A payment system is such that you're never going to be able to make a transaction which is not to the decided person, not to the correct bank account, not at the right date, blah, blah, blah. There's a number of requirements that you describe, which describe what the correct transaction is. Okay. You need to describe that. You need to say, what is it that I don't want to be? Or I should never find myself in such or such situation. That's what, and the tricky part, and that's true for any system, any system. You need to say, my system does this. It, it, it moves A to B, B to C, C to D. Okay, fine. But I never want my, to find myself in E. Okay, so you have you have to think ahead of the problems, and you have to. That's it. 
to, to think very, very differently and not, not only uh, objective oriented, but also f fear oriented. Like what, what is the deepest fear of the, uh, of the Correct. engineer d d developing this program? Correct. What is it that you absolutely don't want to find yourself into? And, and for an AI system, how do you do that? Yeah, because the point is, is that it can lead you basically anywhere, depending on the data you feed it. That's it. So I don't believe in the, the, even, I mean, it's not even formal methods. Tell me what reliable means for an AI system. I do not know. Fascinating. And I think nobody knows. Thank you so much about that, Stefan. This was mind boggling, thought provoking. I loved every second of it. <laughs> any, last, any last word? Uh, there would be so much more to say, I would say. <laughs> we, we can push further if you want. Uh, no, 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 no. I think it's a good basis, but um, I, I would say the final word would be on AI system, particular, but probably true for crypto systems as well, which is why is it that so few people think in terms of that, in terms of we should be able to trust those system? I mean, someone, someone, somehow, someone, somehow should be able to trust those systems. Nobody asks this question. I mean, we... We say, oh, chat GPT, that's so fantastic, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, who tells us that it's truly so blah, blah, blah? I don't know. And I'm very surprised that such systems, and again, probably true for crypto systems, right? don't get me wrong, but they are so in the mood, so at stake, so fast developing. The footprint, footprint is going so high and so broad that I'm always surprised that nobody is really asking, but can we trust them? That's lovely. That's really moving intellectually, and I loved it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Again, my pleasure. It's, I, I, I thank you. I mean, I've not been taking, talking about those things uh, in years, to be honest, uh, although it's always on the top of my mind because my career was highly based on that. And so I'm, I must say I'm very appreciative uh, um, that you, you've been raising that point with me. I mean, it's great to see that there are still some people thinking on those technologies and questions because they are key. I believe in this IT world of ours, it's key that some people are thinking on, on those, those concerns. It's a key concern, definitely a key concern. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Stefan, everyone. This was Stefan Gere. And you can look him up. This was Mutual Knowledge, uh, the podcast. Follow up on every social media. Links in the description. Bye, Stefan. Cheers.